political organizers as well, giving this opportunity to, to uh, show this work in progress and also to uh, acknowledge uh, my cohorts in this uh, work. This is a modeling work, um, and uh, I'm not going to present any data except for the last picture, and it's not a result of this data. So uh, this is primarily a, a basic analysis in support of some remote sensing uh, uh, situations. And uh, to state that also, uh, I said planetary bodies, not only for the moon, but for asteroids, uh, Mercury, uh, Mars, and uh, anything that could be remotely sensed by um, neutron spectroscopy. Uh, so that's the, the main uh, idea of, the, of this title. Also, I specifically specified uh, the spectral energies of the neutrons that we're going to talk about, epithermal, uh, thermal, and fast neutrons. I think we've neglected that there is spectral information uh, coming from uh, neutron spectro uh, spectroscopy. And this analysis uh, aims to make full use of that uh, spectral information. Uh, I think you may have seen this before, but i like just to highlight the process in which is occurring that produces uh, these uh, neutron fluxes that uh, emerges from a uh, soil or regolith. Uh, and to also emphasize that we are probing beneath the surface. Uh, the primary uh, source of these neutron is the uh, direct impact of galactic cosmic rays, such as, as you see uh, over here. Uh, this causes uh, nuclear reactions in the soil, uh, which cause the, uh, the uh, production of fast neutrons. Some of these fast neutrons are uh, it almost escapes immediately, um, or interacts, uh, I think, very rarely with, uh, with the soil, though it does. Uh, but the, these neutrons also occur uh, with collisions inside the soil that probes the composition of the soil. And then it, these moderations, this energy moderated into uh, lower energy, which we are call uh, epithermal neutrons and thermal neutrons. We're not going to say anything about the gamma rays, which is also a byproduct of these uh, cos uh, galactic cosmic rays collisions, uh, in addition to, I think, these natural resources, uh, reactor resources, which also produces uh, diagnostic X-rays, uh, gamma rays, uh, from, uh, from the surface, from below the surface. I think just because Paul didn't know what GN4 was, I, I need to say that this is a, um, a model color simulation which, which can model the generation transport of neutrons in planetary regolith. Uh, of course, GN4 is not the only type of uh, uh, process uh, method that has been done. Uh, I think uh, in more common is the more well-known MCNPX, which is, I think, the tr more traditional Monte Carlo simulation um, program that's uh, been in use for analyzing uh, neutron data. What is unique about GN4 is, and I think is a great advantage, is an open source toolkit. This was, this was a toolkit that was developed by CERN in, 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 uh, in effect, to try to analyze how the detectors work at the large uh, colliders. So there is a lot of particle physics knowledge that's put into it. Uh, the other thing which is very, I think, uh, unique about uh, GN4 as an open source is that there is a large community of users of GN4, whereas I think other codes which are, are much more proprietary and in fact, uh, for example, in MCMPX, there are only a few people who have the keys to, that can open up or change uh, the inner workings of, of that code. So it's a little bit opaque, whereas GM4 is a lot uh, more transparent. And if you have questions, there is a large community of, of worldwide users, uh, as you can see, in, I think, in this slide that uh, are currently using it. And so I think there's advantages of having this open source uh, versus a closed uh, operating system. And so we are uh, concentrating on using this. If you want to see the full use of GN4 code, uh, just go to uh, that website. And you can see that there are applications from particle physics to space physics to 
to uh, what we are doing right now. I think, in fact, uh, there's one paper from the uh, LRO uh, Crater Group uh, that has used GN4 to model the responses of their uh, detector uh, to uh, their uh, signals. Uh, one of the other things is the output of GN4 uh, is in a root object. It's an object-oriented uh, uh, toolkit, and therefore there are many built-in uh, uh, packages and modules that you don't have to rewrite. So if you could understand and decipher all the magic words in an object-oriented toolkit, then there are lots of built-in tools uh, that you don't have to uh, go ahead and, 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 and do uh, beforehand. Uh, just to summarize is that the GCR particles which uh, impact into a regolith, and I'm talking about, I think, uh, example, uh, uh, the moon, uh, really probes only within the upper two meters of the, uh, of, of, of the, of the subsurface. Uh, most of the neutrons which escape really probe, oops, let's go back. really probe about within the 150, 100 uh, centimeters of the surface. Um, if we were to put a layer of hydrogen in this subsurface, certainly the change in the cross sections, particularly for these moderated neutrons, change. In fact, hydrogen uh, has a higher cross section for absorption for these for these moderate uh, uh, epithermal neutrons than uh, for the, the regular regolith material, so that neutron spectroscopy has proven, and especially the epithermal uh, neutron uh, fluxes has proven to be a great probe uh, for the presence of subsurface volatiles. What I'm going to do using GN4 is to do uh, three cases in which we change the structure of this uh, underwater uh, layer of, 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 of uh, hydrogen. Uh, the first case is a single uniform layer of water. Oops, we keep hitting the wrong button. Two uh, meters uh, thick, varying uh, abundances from 0.1 to 10% water weight and also just concentrating on the output flux of the thermal, epithermal, and fast neutrons, neglecting all the gamma rays that may be affected by this. Uh, the second case is when I have a dry layer above a wet layer, and we're going to just use 1, 2, and 5, and 10 percent weight, and this dry layer uh, varies increments of uh, 20 uh, centimeters. The third case is I have a single layer, 25 centimeters thick, and its depth, burial depth, varies uh, in increments of 25 uh, centimeters. I would just do the uniform, show you the results of the uniform first. Um, this is the emergent flux of, uh, of uh, the full spectrum of neutrons. The x-axis is energy, so this is essentially uh, uh, one MeV right here. This is hard to see, and this is varying with uh, abundances from 0.1% to 10% uh, water abundance. It's hard to see actually traits of what's happening, uh, so I plotted a three-dimensional uh, waterfall in which this axis is again uh, abundance. So this is 10% going into uh, that 0.1% in those various increments. You could see uh, trends and some of these features are creases and features which persist through all this so those are not noise in this Monte Carlo simulation but are real uh, features. What I do is now take the ratio of dry uh, material, ratio it to uh, the uh, various energies, 
And arbitrarily, this is a generic energy band, which I call uh, thermal from 0.4 less. Uh, epithermal goes up to uh, 1 MeV and call this fast. This is not any uh, particular instrumental response. This is just a generic uh, 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 bending of these energy uh, bands. When I do that and plot it as a function of abundance, this is what I get. You can see the solid lines are the result of that GN4 calculations for epithermal. You can see why epithermal is used as a, a surrogate for uh, a broad abundance. This dotted line is not a fit, but it's a fit to previous uh, Monte Carlo models uh, with these coefficients put in. And the fact that it fits so well tells me that these calculations have some merit. You can see that the, epi, that the thermal also uh, is a function, could be used as a function of water abundance, whereas the fast signal is not as uh, sensitive to this water abundance uh, ability. Now I'm going to do this uh, dry layer over uh, abundance of, of uh, varying abundances of water layer, and in which the uh, free parameter now is the burial depth. You can again see the same type of cascading problem. This is now 10% wet. That's what that layer, buried layer is as a function of the burial depth. You can see that. Uh, you can see again this type of variations of thermal, epithermal, and fast. This is the ratio of that emission uh, to dry. And again, when you look at the ratio as a function of that burial parameter, you can see that the thermal emission has a varying emission. Uh, the epithermal emission uh, changes as the burial depth increases. The FAST is not so diagnostic. I will now use a single layer so that there is a burial depth. The single layer is 25 centimeters thick. The free parameter now is the burial depth. I'm using a 10% weight as a uh, model parameter. This is that stack uh, variations. Again, you can see this is, you know, a lot of these features uh, evolve as you go into the burial depth. This is that ratio. There's a lot of information in the shape, but it's very difficult to think of actually constructing a spectrometer, currently a spectrometer, that can have that type of spectral resolution, although it's possible. And we're exploring ways of maybe thinking of, thinking of making advanced instruments that can retrieve that actual shape. Here is, again, uh, the ratio from to dry as a function of that burial depth. What you see here, these lines are for uniform uh, abundances. So, you know, it doesn't matter what the depth is, the abundance is uniform. You could see that this thermal gradient uh, may be indication of the burial depth. So the summary is, I think the burial depth of wet cell modifies the merchant ne neutron spectrum. It's, it's, this, this preliminary calculation shows that it has, a, has a, actually a very uh, wide uh, 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 dependency. And this emergent flux compared to dry cell and thermal epithermal and fast which show different behavior as a function of the burial depth. But the, I think the thermal neutron flux uh, decreasing monotonically, it may act as a probe to, the, to that depth itself. I show this picture of, uh, that I think uh, John Keller showed as, as that's the two-dimensional spatial distribution of LEN uh, data at Shoemaker uh, Crater with, uh, with the Lolo topography overlay onto it now. With this method, we will have be able to uh, also map the third dimension. Uh, and, and see what the vertical structure of this of these uh, lend uh, neutron uh, volatile deposits might be. Uh, uh, take some questions. We have time. Unfortunately, we don't have time. We are a little bit behind schedule. I want to get right back on schedule. Okay. So very interesting talk on Gantt on Gantt four. So um, if you want to.